Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOCs course on Economics of Health and Education. In lesson 1 of this week, we studied about inequalities of uh, opportunities uh, in the context of uh, sense capability approach. We also studied about early childhood inequalities by uh, taking reference to James Heckman's works. We must understand that inequality of opportunities result in inequalities of outcomes in terms of different aspects, health and education being some of the most uh, common uh, outcome indicators of inequalities of opportunities. In uh, this class, uh, we will uh, focus a little more on education inequalities by taking reference to the economist Francis Stewart's work on ver vertical and horizontal inequalities. Uh, we will also uh, discuss about some of the traditional approaches that e economics of education has taken to assess inequalities of uh, education. So, in this uh, class, we will uh, consider uh, the following topics. First, we will look at uh, some of the different uh, types of education inequalities. Uh, we will uh, study about vertical and horizontal inequalities in the context of individual capabilities and inequalities between groups. And we will also study how has economics traditionally approached the study of educational inequalities. Now, broadly in education, we measure inequalities or uh, in uh, three forms. Uh, we uh, measure inequalities by education in life outcomes by focusing on earnings and well-being. In some of the previous classes, we have studied about intergenerational mobility or differences in earnings uh, based upon higher education, uh, which is an example of how we measure inequalities by education in life outcomes. Uh, so we can also have inequalities in education between groups, which is uh, the focus of today's uh, lesson. Uh, does education lead to social mobility or reinforce group based disadvantages is uh, a topic of discussion which is increasingly being considered in the uh, area of development economics. Uh, traditionally, sociologists have focused on stratification and how uh, different uh, stratified uh, groups go towards different education outcomes. Uh, however, in the recent times, economists have also started considering uh, studying about group based inequalities, uh, which we will uh, discuss today. Uh, there are also inequalities of resources and opportunities which we have discussed earlier and these are available to children, young people and adults and how it impacts their inequality of outcomes is also a discussion that is often taken up in the context of educational inequalities. Now, uh, I would like to uh, talk about uh, uh, global inequality of opportunity. Uh, there are some interesting data that has been discussed in the UN Human Development Report uh, recently, which talks about uh, global inequality, uh, particularly with respect to health and education achievements, uh, which compels us to reach a conclusion that living conditions are vastly unequal in different places in our world today. And today's global inequality of opportunity means that what matters most for our living conditions is the good or bad luck of our place of birth. And where we are located today makes a huge difference to uh, what impact it has on our education and health outcomes. If you look at this map here on your slide, you will see this uh, is a world a map of uh, inequality in education 2022 based upon data source provided by the UNDP uh, Human Development Report of 2024. Uh, this is the latest report that we have and here uh, an inequality measure referred to as Atkinson index of inequality measure has been calculated for uh, education in all countries of the world. Uh, so, this uh, index ranges from the value 0 to 1 and in the map here you will see that there are values ranging from about 0 to uh, 0 0.5. Uh, higher values indicate higher inequality and inequality is measured here in terms of the number of years uh, adults older than 25 participated in formal education. You will see that most uh, Asian and South Asian and uh, African countries appear to uh, be facing higher levels of inequality as far as education is concerned. Uh, 
uh, and this forces us, compels us to look at uh, the geography and the structural characteristics of the geography, uh, various kinds of social, uh, political and economic aspects that may be contributing to inequality in education. So, this is uh, simply to draw your attention to some of the recent data which talks about uh, higher levels of relatively high levels of inequality in education in uh, the global south particularly in South Asia and Africa. Uh, this also must be understood in the context that uh, over the period of last uh, 50 years or so, 100 years or so, um, levels of education have increased. We have already studied that. Now, the uh, gender based inequalities in education have declined, even group based uh, uh, differences in uh, educational attainments have uh, declined and uh, given the relative developments that we have seen in the last so many years, this is where we stand today. Uh, this figure here on your slide uh, also uh, shows us some very interesting finding with regard to global inequality in living conditions. Uh, this shows us the distance between the world's worst off and best off countries. Uh, so, if you look at the first bar here, this sh uh, shows us mortality rate of children under the age of 5 based upon 2017 data and this shows that uh, 0.21 percent of uh, children under the age of uh, 5 uh, faced mortality rate in Iceland which is the best of country whereas the rate was 12.7 percent in Somalia which is the um, worst of country. Uh, this also says that uh, children in uh, Somalia are 60 times more likely to die uh, children under the age of 5 are 60 times more likely to die because of mortality um, morbidity conditions. The global average is uh, 3.9 percent and uh, the uh, worst of country which is Somalia here, uh, if you look at the distance between the global average and uh, the mortality uh, being faced by Somalia is also very uh, high. Uh, interestingly, the global average in 1800 as far as mortality rate of children under the age of 5 is concerned was about 43 percent. The second bar uh, shows you uh, life expectancy at birth based on 2017 data and here the distance is shown between Sierra Leone and uh, Japan. Japan uh, facing a highest life expectancy at birth at 84.1 years and Sierra Leone facing uh, the lowest life expectancy at birth at 52 years. Uh, so, it is 1.6 times more likely in Japan uh, for an average person to be able to live till the age of 84 uh, years. The global average is about 72.2 years. Uh, Indian average is also very close to the global average. And interestingly, in, uh, the global average of life expectancy at birth in 1800 was 29 years. So, uh, this uh, figure also shows the uh, inequality conditions uh, between the best of countries and the worst of countries and the global average in between. The third uh, bar shows you mean years of schooling, uh, schooling received by people older than 24 years. So, this is adult mean years of schooling based upon data for 2017. The global average is about 8.4 years, which means that on an average uh, a person globally a person attains about uh, 8 years of education or a little more. Uh, the worst of country here is Burkina Faso where the average mean years of schooling for adults more than 24 years is only 1.5 years as compared to Germany which is about 14 years of education. The global average in 1800 was less than a year. I find this figure very interesting because it tells us about the distance between the best of country and the worst of country while also telling us how much progress we have made in the last 200 years or so. If you look at the next bar, it tells us about the expected years of schooling for a child of school entrance age in 2017. The global average is about 12.7 uh, years which means that on an average the expected years of schooling for a child who is entering school is about uh, 12 years or more uh, globally. Uh, the worst of country is 4.9 years which is South Sudan. And the best of country which is actually an outlier country is Australia which is 22.9 years. In Western Europe 
uh, there are 15 to 20 years of expected years of schooling is estimated for a child in a school entrance age. In the US it is about 16 and a half years, 16.5 years. Um, and the global average in 1800 was less than a year. So, in the last 200 years we have immensely progressed in terms of years of schooling, the expected years of schooling for a child of school going age or school entrance age. Uh, whereas, if you look at the uh, global inequality in terms of the best of and the worst of countries, it is uh, too high to be able to be bridged in a short span of time. Some of the uh, largest inequalities are observed in the context of average income. So, the last bar here shows the GDP per capita adjusted for price differences between countries based upon 2017 data. The best of country Qatar is at 116,936 dollars. The worst of country Central African Republic is about 661 dollars. The global average is about 15,000 469 dollars and if you look at the gap between Qatar and Central uh, African Republic, it is very large 172 times more than Central African Republic. Uh, Switzerland is about 87 times more than the worst of country. Uh, the distance between the global average and the best of country is also very large. The distance between the second uh, uh, best of country Switzerland and the global average is also very large. The global average in 1800 was less than 1000 dollars. So, this figure here very interestingly tells us that global inequality is a result of inequality of opportunities and inequality of outcomes. Uh, is largely locational in nature as these uh, geographical uh, differences or geographical barriers come out very strongly in the context of uh, global inequalities uh, of education or health or other socio-economic aspects. Uh, so, this is something that we begin uh, today's uh, discussion with. So, uh, just to highlight on health and education aspects of uh, the global inequality that we have just seen, uh, you cannot get healthy and wealthy on your own, societies make progress and not individuals and that is uh, what I want to uh, deal with in today's class because we want to talk about group based inequalities uh, while uh, economists and social scientists have uh, given a lot of emphasis on vertical inequalities or differences between individuals, heterogeneous is between different individuals, we often talk very less about group based inequalities and therefore, uh, it is important for us to devote a lesson uh, to this. So, in the context of the figure that we just saw in the health aspects, a child born in one of the countries with the worst health is 60 times more likely to die than a child born in a country with the best health. It is immaterial even if we do not concern ourselves with which country, but the very fact that globally these are the realities where uh, in one country uh, the child born is, uh, is facing worst health. 60 times and is 60 times more likely to die than a child born in a country with the best health. This itself suggests uh, social inequality of the highest order and inequality of opportunities of various kinds that need urgent attention. In several African countries, more than 1 out of 10 children born today will die before they are 5 years old. In the healthiest countries of the world in Europe and East Asia, only 1 in 250 children will die before he or she is 5 years old. So, these estimates really bring out the starkness of inequalities, global inequalities that we are experiencing even today. In the context of education in countries where people have the best access to education in Europe and North America, children of school entrance age today can expect 15 to 20 years of formal education. In Australia, which is an outlier, school life expectancy is 22.9 years or close to 23 years and children entering school simultaneously in countries with the poorest access to education can only expect 5 years. And earlier we have already studied uh, children tend to learn much less in poorer countries which requires uh, radical changes in pedagogy styles or uh, minimal investments in creation of primary schools, teacher training programs and so on and so forth. So, with this backdrop now, uh, I want to focus on uh, Francis Stewart 
a development economist uh, who has worked extensively on the issue of vertical inequalities and horizontal inequalities. Traditionally, sociologists have focused on stratification in society and how different groups have different uh, uh, social outcomes. And uh, there is a deep uh, rooted sociological understanding that have been provided by social uh, scientists. In the recent years, economists have also worked on the issue of group based inequalities and this is what we will uh, discuss uh, now. But uh, just for reference, we have already discussed about vertical inequalities. So, definitionally vertical inequalities refer to inequalities between individuals or households and they are typically measured in terms of income, wealth, education or some personal attributes and they are often represented by the commonly used metrics of Gini coefficient or income percentiles. So, for example, in some of the last classes where we have studied about earnings differentials between men and women who are higher educated and so on. We have also looked at uh, some of the um, uh, inequality uh, measures in the context of health uh, that we studied in this week. Uh, these are all uh, instances of vertical inequalities uh, that have been experienced between different uh, individuals. In the context of vertical inequalities, the primary concern is their impact on social mobility, economic growth and overall social welfare and high levels of vertical inequality can lead to reduced social mobility, economic inefficiencies and increased poverty. But what about horizontal inequalities? So, horizontal inequalities refer to inequalities among groups of people who are differentiated by socially constructed markers such as ethnicity, religion, language or region. And unlike vertical inequalities which are based on individual characteristics like income or wealth, horizontal inequalities pertain to group based uh, disparities. Uh, Francis Stewart in this uh, connection has provided uh, various dimensions and implications of horizontal inequalities. Uh, for one, horizontal inequalities can exist across multiple dimensions. For example, uh, differences in income, wealth and employment opportunities among groups can give rise to horizontal economic inequalities. Uh, disparities in access to education, health care and other social services can give rise to horizontal social inequalities. Unequal representation and participation in political processes can give rise to horizontal political inequalities. Recognition and respect for cultural identities and practices can give rise to horizontal cultural inequalities. And uh, various scholars and various studies in the recent years have been able to uh, collect primary data in different uh, region contexts and been able to uh, estimate horizontal inequalities based on uh, different multiple uh, dimensions. So, in this context, Francis Stewart has argued that horizontal inequalities are particularly problematic because they can lead to social and political instability. Uh, when significant disparities exist between groups, there are deprivations between different groups of population. It gives rise to resentment, marginalization and grievances and which may ultimately lead to open conflicts and violence as we have seen in uh, many country contexts including that of India. So, horizontal inequalities in the words of Francis Stewart can actually undermine national unity and social cohesion and therefore, while economists are talking about vertical inequalities and inequality needs to be reduced, uh, we need to uh, focus on horizontal inequalities as well in terms of economic assessments and measurements of inequality. Now, to be able to uh, emphasize on the importance of horizontal inequalities, Stuart uh, tries to look at inequalities in the context of non-economic goals because often in the context of economics of health and education or as economists, we tend to overemphasize on the importance of income or earnings and how uh, inequalities between different individuals leads to or inequalities of opportunities leads to differences in inequalities of outcomes without giving proper emphasis on what are the non-economic goals that should also enter into the utility function of an individual. So, it is in this context that Stuart discusses about horizontal inequalities and non-economic goals, some of which I have taken uh, from uh, the, her papers to discuss in today's class. So, first is enhancement of people's well-being and equitable sharing in benefits. 
Now, well being is a function of many elements, including an individual's family, social, and societal circumstances. Um, in, a, in a very narrow sense of the term, uh, in economics, we define well being in terms of incomes, but well being is a function of many elements. And uh, as is described here, that it includes an individual's family, social, and societal circumstances, their personal disposition, the resources available to them, their security and autonomy, and their satisfaction with their status, which depends not just on their own position but also that of others. So, this is an all encompassing definition of what well being is, uh, which uh, is considered to be non economic in nature. But horizontal inequalities can have direct bearing on many of these elements. Uh, for example, members of poorer groups obviously suffer from fewer resources than richer groups and have poorer health, while political horizontal inequalities can imply that they have limited autonomy and that impacts their overall uh, well-being or functioning within the economy. So, the existence of horizontal inequalities can have a negative impact on people's perception of their well-being as they value not only their own resources but identify with the situation of the group as a whole. Uh, so, how an individual identifies himself or herself in reference to the group as a whole also determines their well-being. And considerable evidence has been produced on the negative psychological effects of uh, group based inequalities. For example, in the context of USA, racial inequality in relation to the position of US blacks has been widely studied. Uh, many scholars have also argued uh, in this context that the well being of the group to which the individual belongs. Uh, therefore, should enter into the utility function of an individual in addition to the individual's own income. Uh, and this is an area which is not considered in the context of mainstream economics or neoclassical economics. Group based identity politics does not usually enter into the uh, utility maximization principles or functions of uh, mainstream economics, which is being increasingly considered as an, uh, an expanding area of study in uh, social economics or uh, development economics. Similarly, empowerment to participate freely in development can uh, be influenced or have influences uh, from horizontal inequalities. We understand that inequalities of any kind are disempowering, but horizontal inequalities can be particularly disempowering. Uh, implicit and explicit discrimination can prevent particular groups from full participation at local and national levels. Uh, an extreme example is that of scheduled castes and tribes in India who were debarred from many activities earlier and in uh, certain contexts continue to be debarred uh, from many activities in uh, local contexts, although it is illegal in nature. In the past, untouchability in India uh, has also uh, prevented people's participation in labor markets or uh, participation in everyday uh, social life, uh, social functionings, uh, which is illegal today. Disempowerment due to group membership is especially the case for those minority groups which are deprived of political power as well as being relatively impoverished economically. There are many such examples including indigenous peoples in Latin America, the Uyghurs in China, Muslims in Myanmar, Philippines and Thailand. Uh, However, where the poorer groups form a majority, they may dominate politics, particularly in a democratic system, despite their lower economic status and in such cases, economic horizontal inequalities alone may not lead to uh, disempowerment. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, what uh, Stuart is trying to impress upon here is that horizontal inequalities can be deeply disempowering because uh, the uh, group membership that an individual belongs to, uh, particularly uh, especially if they are from the minority groups, they can feel uh, limited in their autonomy with respect to their participation in general political and socio-economic affairs of the country. Similarly, environmental sustainability is an important aspect of horizontal inequality. Uh, we have seen that justice across generations requires environmental sustainability in contemporary actions and inequality is often tied up with environmental sustainability in many ways. Uh, for example, uh, the poorest people uh, generally tend to suffer most from environmental costs even though they typically do not contribute much to them. Uh, we have also seen that poorer people and countries 
are located in areas that are more affected by climate change. Uh, some estimates show that from 2000 to 2004, high income countries faced uh, just 1.5 percent of the risk of poor countries of being affected by natural disasters. Uh, similarly, poorer people and groups within a country suffer proportionately more from environmental costs because uh, more people in poorer countries are farmers who are particularly badly affected and poor people have fewer protective mechanisms in place when disasters occur. So, in summary, uh, failure to achieve environmental sustainability is uh, likely to worsen both horizontal and vertical inequality, uh, while inequality tends to make the achievements of sustainability more difficult. Uh, irrespective of these instrumental reasons, justice requires that our limited global resources be fairly distributed across people and groups. Uh, some of the estimates uh, show in 2010, for example, the carbon emissions per head were 11,579 kilotons in rich countries and in poor countries 0.3 uh, kilotons with a global limit on the amount that can be emitted safely, justice clearly demands redistribution. So, the idea of uh, social justice with respect to uh, carbon emissions, who are uh, the emitters and who are the victims of emissions requires an understanding of uh, horizontal inequality or uh, social justice uh, development and ethics in terms of how we want to measure um, the uh, uh, costs associated with uh, environmental uh, damages and losses and so on. Similarly, there are two more aspects, particularly with regard to promotion of human rights and promotion of cultural freedom. The existence of significant horizontal inequalities implies that human rights of some groups are impaired, particularly in poorer societies. And usually, uh, challenges with respect or deprivations with respect to human rights goals does not enter into uh, utility functions of individuals. However, uh, increasingly, economists have become sensitive to the idea of uh, how such group based inequalities, particularly in the context of human rights violations, can lead to a decreased utility as far as individuals are concerned or individuals with group memberships are concerned. So, poorer groups have limited access to health services, education of a reasonable quality or shelter and these are all important human rights. Uh, similarly, political and cultural freedoms of some groups are often constrained, uh, which means that universal human rights are not realized and that also impacts their outcomes or achievements or uh, deprivations in terms of human development indicators. And in general, full acceptance of a human rights approach to development would involve a significant reduction in horizontal inequalities almost everywhere. So, the point being that while we are talking about vertical inequalities, without uh, deliberate efforts at reducing horizontal inequalities, uh, we will not see much difference to uh, vertical inequalities because uh, in the words of uh, Francis Stewart, horizontal inequalities are more prone to uh, conflicts giving rise to open conflicts within the society, divisive politics within the society which can lead to overall decline in welfare as far as the society is concerned. Concern. Culture is a group characteristic and cultural freedom implies a lack of constraints on group practices unless these are justified by a strongly negative impact of some cultural practices on others. And restrictions on cultural freedom lie at the heart of horizontal inequalities in cultural status or recognition. In uh, Sri Lanka, for example, the Tamil language was not recognized in government businesses. In Turkey, until 1990, the Kurds were not allowed to use their language in public. In Tibet, there are several restrictions on practice of Buddhism. In Egypt, Christian churches are subject to restrictions and attack. And these restrictions on cultural freedom constitute horizontal inequalities in cultural recognition. So, large horizontal inequalities present a severe a uh, barrier to the achievement of a just society in which people's well-being, capabilities and human rights are realized. And horizontal inequalities uh, predisposes societies to violent conflict and are a clear indicator of inequity. And the combination of reinforcing economic, political and cultural inequalities make them particularly intractable. Yet, in global dialogue, particularly in neoliberal economics, they are invisible 
even though the importance of tackling vertical inequality is increasingly recognized. At a national level where these inequalities are more clearly visible and felt, there is much more recognition and in some cases effective counteraction showing that it is possible to devise and implement policies uh, to reduce horizontal inequalities. So, uh, neoclassical economics or mainstream economics has to a large extent been uh, blind to the issues of horizontal inequalities. However, heterodox economists in the recent times have uh, brought to limelight these issues such as uh, these uh, which requires to be considered in the context of uh, uh, economics of education and health in particular. Uh, because group based inequalities have huge ramifications and implications in the context of inequality studies. Another important point that uh, in the context of this discussion of horizontal and vertical inequalities that economists like uh, Francis Stewart have advocated is that there is a tendency for horizontal inequalities to persist and because of persistence of these horizontal inequalities, uh, there is not much dent that could be made on uh, eradication of vertical inequalities because there is a tendency for uh, group based inequalities to uh, linger on for a very long period of time uh, giving rise to you know, various kinds of conflicts and issues at the uh, macroeconomic level. So, from the perspective of individual welfare, persistent group inequalities are likely to hinder the deprived as they are as they limit the possibility of moving up the distribution. So, even where individuals can move up, where there is persistent group inequality, the group as a whole cannot and thus an individual's chance of upward mobility is less for a member of a poorer group than for a member of a richer group and this is likely to affect people's view of their own and their descendants life chances. I had discussed this briefly in the context of intergenerational mobility. Uh, despite achievement of higher education in the context of the US blacks, for example, uh, so there are uh, which is where the role of affirmative action or uh, reservation policies uh, come into uh, uh, being. So, persistent uh, HIs or horizontal inequalities have a greater negative impact on current generations than non-group based persistent uh, vertical inequalities in so far as there is more possibility of individuals and their children escaping from being stuck at the lower end of the distribution in non-group based inequality than there is for members of deprived groups to escape the lower end of the distribution in group based inequality. So, based on empirical evidence Stuart argues that it is more difficult to escape from group deprivation than individual deprivation that is not group based. In the USA, black white inequalities date back to slavery in the 17th century. Despite affirmative action policies, uh, some estimates show that in 2001, the real median income of black families was about 62 percent of whites. In absolute terms, the black white real median income gap doubled uh, during the period 1947 to 2001. In the context of India, uh, Muslim Hindu inequalities have persisted throughout the 20th century. Many estimates, uh, for example, that of Deolalika 2008 show that educational disadvantages of Muslims were broadly constant from the 1900s. Similarly, black white inequalities in South Africa date back to the white settler immigration in the 19th century. Even after a decade of black majority rule, income per capita of blacks was just about 12 percent uh, that of whites in the 2000s. So, uh, just to give an illustration of group based inequalities, uh, this is based upon Francis Stewart's horizontal inequality two types of trap. Uh, this table here uh, presents data on educational mobility among Muslims and Hindus in India, focusing on uh, differences in education levels between fathers and their children aged 15 to 19. Uh, this table is divided into two main categories, male children and uh, female children and each category further breaks down into four groups based on uh, the father's education level. So, uh, if we focus on proportion of uh, children with uh, less education than their fathers and if you look at the category male children, you will see that a higher percentage of Muslim children 54 percent have no education compared to Hindu children which is 39 percent. 
Similarly, Muslim children are more likely, uh, which is 22 percent, to have completed only primary education compared to Hindu children, which is 12 percent. A higher percentage of Muslim children have completed secondary education compared to uh, Hindu children, which is uh, 57 percent. For female children, uh, you have uh, similar uh, kinds of estimates where female children have a slightly higher percentage of no education compared Muslim female children have a slightly higher percentage of no education compared to Hindu female children. Uh, Muslim female children, 28% uh, are more likely to have completed primary education than Hindu female children, which is 22%. Uh, the percentage of Muslim female children completing secondary education, 70% is higher compared to Hindu female children. Um, if with regard to proportion of children age 15 to 19 with more education than their fathers, we will see that a lower percentage of Muslim children have more education than their fathers compared to uh, Hindu children. And we have similar kinds of estimates in uh, for uh, the uh, rest of the indicators as well. So, these, uh, this table basically tells us that shows us the importance of horizontal inequalities and uh, with respect to horizontal inequalities, it shows us that there are disparities between different groups within a society often based on ethnicity, religion or other group identities. And this data suggests that Muslim children are more likely to have no education or only primary education compared to Hindu children. And additionally, the likelihood of Muslim children progressing in higher education is also lower. This is in the context of India. We have similar kinds of findings in the context of scheduled caste and scheduled tribe population in India, which is also considered as group based inequalities. When we look at inequality of education and health achievements by outcomes, we see that there are marginalized groups of population that show up uh, persistently in uh, socioeconomic studies uh, with respect to underachievements or deprivations with regard to health and education. So far uh, in this uh, lesson, we have discussed about uh, the um, often an underrepresented information on horizontal inequalities. Uh, in neoclassical economics or mainstream economics usually focuses on vertical inequalities. But when we are discussing in the context of global inequality and if we want to study um, social inequalities, particularly in the context of education or health, we need to consider horizontal inequalities because they have a tendency to persist over a long period of time and therefore it requires uh, political attention as well as urgent policy attention. Now, let me uh, conclude this lesson by focusing on uh, some of the important ways in which economics of education has studied inequalities traditionally. So, economic theories on education inequalities have often focused on understanding the causes and consequences of disparities in educational access, attainment and quality. And these theories seek to explain why such inequalities exist, how they impact economic outcomes and what policy measures might be required to mitigate them. We have extensively discussed the human capital theory. Uh, there is no need to go into the details of this theory here, but we need to understand that the human capital theory suggests that disparities in educational attainment lead to differences in income and economic mobility. And therefore, this theory often explores the returns on investment in education and the role of early childhood education in shaping future outcomes. The signaling theory is often used in the context of education and according to this theory, education serves as a signal to employers about an individual's abilities, skills and productivity and inequalities in educational access and quality can thus lead to differences in labor market outcomes because employers may use educational credentials as a proxy for potential job performance. Uh, similarly, credit constraints and borrowings have also been considered explicitly in the context of educational inequalities where the focus is on financial barriers to education. Uh, they argue that individuals from lower income backgrounds may be unable to finance education uh, leading to lower educational attainment and perpetuating economic inequalities because of which various kinds of policy focus has also been provided to loans and contingencies and so on. 
Similarly, neighborhood effects have been studied extensively in the context of educational inequalities, which suggests that students in disadvantaged areas may have access to lower quality schools, fewer resources and less positive role models, which can limit their educational and economic prospects. Public goods and externalities in this uh, theory, education is often viewed as a public good that provides positive externalities such as higher levels of participation and lower crime rates and economic theories in this area explore how unequal access to uh, quality education affects these broader societal benefits and the role of government intervention in providing equitable educational opportunities. Intergenerational mobility and inequality are often studied in the context of education inequalities and these theories basically look at how parental income, education and other socioeconomic factors influence educational outcomes of their children thereby perpetuating cycles of poverty or uh, wealth. Similarly, uh, cultural capital, which is a, a concept often linked to sociological theories, they suggest that non-economic factors like cultural knowledge, attitudes and behaviors also play a significant role in educational success and inequalities in cultural capital can lead to disparities in educational achievement and access to opportunities. Institutional and structural factors have also been examined with regard to how systemic and institutional factors such as uh, discrimination, uh, segregation and policy decisions contribute to educational inequalities. Economics of discrimination has uh, come out as a separate discipline in itself which focuses on some of the systemic factors and they emphasize on the role of public policies in mitigating or exacerbating disparities in education. Now, how has economics of education traditionally approached the problem of education inequalities mostly by carrying out measurements and analysis of educational outcomes. Uh, we have developed metrics to assess educational outcomes such as test scores, graduation rates and educational attainment uh, by different groups such as race, gender and geography. Uh, the often uh, used metric of human capital and returns to education by quantifying returns to education, we highlight the economic benefits of reducing education inequalities and make a case for investment in education. Similarly, policy interventions and evaluations, particularly in the context of early childhood education programs uh, have been highlighted, school funding programs, affirmative actions and scholarships programs. Uh, addressing financial barriers, non-monetary factors and externalities, uh, labor market outcomes and inequalities, an important aspect of studying education inequalities and of course international comparisons uh, have been carried out as we have seen in the beginning of this class in terms of global inequality studies and what are the different kinds of interventions that need to be carried out at the national level or subnational levels to mitigate these inequalities is an important area of study. So, with this uh, we now conclude our discussion about uh, inequalities. We in this week we started discussing about inequalities of opportunities and uh, we uh, took reference to a few scholars for example, Amartya Sen whose life work has been on inequality and capabilities approach. Uh, we looked at the uh, limitations of looking at uh, of taking income as the important representative indicator of inequality. We also studied Heckman's uh, uh, ideas around inequality. We took up some of the issues in health inequity and then we concluded with looking at uh, the differences between vertical and horizontal inequalities and how in the recent times economists have contributed a lot to the understanding of group based inequalities and how that has impacted uh, inequalities of outcomes particularly in the context of education. For this uh, class I have uh, extensively referred to the websites our world in data. I have uh, taken reference to this website in the earlier classes as well. Uh, this is uh, the material can be uh, used uh, by uh, anyone located anywhere in this country or around the world and it gives us um, great insights into comparative data, uh, researched data on uh, uh, social outcome indicators particularly health and education. I encourage the learners of this course to extensively use the data 
uh, from uh, this website to be able to understand these uh, issues in much more detail. I have also extensively referenced uh, Francis Stewart's work on horizontal inequalities that have appeared in the Journal of Human Development and Capabilities uh, on uh, her book in Horizontal Inequalities and Conflict, Understanding Group Violence in Multi-Ethnic Societies, uh, also uh, working papers and papers from the World Institute for Development Economics Research, the Rutledge Handbook of Development Ethics. So, if you can find some of these materials online, I would encourage you to go through them. Otherwise, the material shared with you as part of the course will suffice for you to understand, have a brief understanding about these different kinds of inequalities. Uh, so, let us end today's class with this. See you in the next class. Thank you. Thank you.